So like I said, so now everything's recording, um, but like Paul said, I'm Taylor. Um, I'm currently uh, doing my master's at Stockton University in American Studies. Um, I recently graduated from there with my bachelor's in literature. And so today I'll talk a little bit about the Lenai Lenape and focusing more on the Tuckerton and sort of Southern Ocean County into Atlantic County area. Um, while I share my presentation, I'll turn my camera off. Um, there'll be a few natural breaks in the presentation. At that point, I'll turn my camera back on. Um, if anyone wants to put any questions in the chat while I'm presenting during those breaks, then I'll answer them. And then at the end, uh, we'll do a formal Q&A. Okay, can everybody see this uh, presentation now? Yep, looks great, Taylor. All right. Okay, so first I'd like to start off by reading a land acknowledgement statement from the Nanticoke Lenai Lenape Tribal Nation Headquarters website. The land upon which we gather is part of the traditional territory of the Lenai Lenape, called Lenape Hogang. The Lenape people lived in harmony with one another upon this territory for thousands of years. During the colonial era and early federal period, many were removed west and north, but some also remain among the continuing historical tribal communities of the region. The Nanticoke Lenape, Lenape Tribal Nation, the Ramapo Lenape Nation, and the Powhatan Lenape Nation, the Nanticoke of Millsboro, Delaware, and the Lenape of Cheswold, Delaware. We acknowledge the Lenai Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. In our acknowledgement of the continued presence of the Lenape people in their homeland, we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief Temenant, that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. And so before we move on, I'd like to explain why this statement's important. Uh, it reminds us that the land that we zoom from, the land we talk about uh, today, it's hundreds and hundreds, of thousands and thousands of years of history that's led up to now. Uh, it prompts us to take a moment to appreciate this land uh, and the indigenous people whose land we live on. Uh, and this type of reflection is always relevant, uh, but it seems even more relevant, uh, especially since we just recently celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday. Um, Northwestern University um, discusses these declarations on their website. Uh, and they had a really um, interesting perspective that they shared. Um, they said that land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or a historical context. Uh, colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation, uh, end quote. And so um, I just wanted to start off um, with this statement uh, just to get us in that mindset um, that we, you know, we all, we are really talking about the Lenape Lenape and history, but it's not just in the past. Um, it's continuous, uh, it's past, present, and future. And so uh, today's presentation is a little bit of an outline just to give you an idea of what to expect. And so um, with that, I'll go over uh, a bit about the Midden or the Clamshell Mound located in Tuckerton. Um, then I'll talk about the uh, archeological site uh, known as the Pinella site, uh, which is what's today known as the Atlantis Golf Course, uh, borderline between Tuckerton and Little Egg Harbor. Um, and then after that, I'll talk a little bit about the Nanticoke Lenape Lenape Tribal Nation, uh, their headquarters in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and how to um, learn more on their website, uh, followed by, of course, the Q&A. Uh, interspersed throughout and then more so at the end. And so um, first, um, here's a photograph of the uh, Midden or the Clamshell Mound. Um, uh, this one was taken by me um, earlier uh, this spring. And um, to give you an idea, um, the Tuckerton uh, Midden uh, is located right off of Great Bay Boulevard. And so uh, first I'll rewind a little bit and we'll talk a little bit about what a midden is. Uh, so a midden is a refuse pile or a garbage heap 
Um, as an archaeological feature, uh, they typically contain uh, lots of artifacts within one localized space. Uh, this can include anything from discarded food scraps, broken tools, uh, any other sorts of utilitarian items um, that have become unusable, things that people would you know, throw out, essentially a landfill. Um, uh, Thought Co., uh, there's an article from 2019 uh, that they uh, published, and the author K. Chris Hurst notes that uh, the word midden is derived from the Danish word uh, koken modding or kitchen mound. Um, I definitely did not uh, pronounce that right, um, but I, so I apologize for that. Um, but it's spelled over here. Um, and so middens are important in archaeology uh, because they reveal cultural behaviors, daily practices, rituals, and even like the status and the wealth groups. Uh, you can learn a lot about society um, by the materials that they use every day and what they throw out. Um, middens can indicate a uh, familial or community presence, depending on the size, um, whether it's something more localized or something that um, the larger community would use. And they're also useful because the items found within these middens can be radiocarbon dated to determine how old the group who lived there was. And so um, on the left-hand side, uh, there's an aerial view of the Tuckerton Clamshell Mound um, photograph that I found online. Um, that'll be from a video that I'll show um, soon. And so about this specific midden, uh, this clamshell mound, like I've mentioned a few times previously, it's in Tuckerton, in New Jersey, off of Great Bay Boulevard, or more, for, you know, more known as Seven Bridges Road. Um, it's part of the Great Bay Wildlife Management Area, which is also part of the Jacques Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve. And so it's considered to be the clamming work site uh, to the base camp and covered at the nearby Pinellas site, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, that's the one that today would be known as the uh, Atlantis Golf Course. Um, this place was uh, also excavated in the 1970s. Um, and uh, in this area, there's a mix of hard shell clams and oyster shells. And the mound itself is currently about nine feet high and 80 feet long. Um, lots of different articles date it differently, um, but um, typically um, the assumption is that this can date back up to thousands of years and that it's something that's been continuously used. And uh, the mound itself, if you um, can notice here, you'll see that there's a lot of cedar trees around it. Um, that's because of the refuse that um, was piled in that one area, um, the natural decomposition of, you know, clams and oysters, you know, left over. Um, those actually impact the quality of the soil. And so you'll notice um, in the video later on that there's uh, a concentration of cedar trees there and the whole rest of the salt marsh is um, relatively marshy. Um, and so now I'm going to mute myself. And so if Caitlin can share her screen so that she could play uh, the video, I'm going to try to do it first on here, but I've been having some bandwidth issues. So let's see. Seems like it's buffering a lot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop share, I'm gonna mute my screen and I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin. Okay, no problem, Taylor. Um, let me share. Oh, hold on. And so I'll do a little bit of a voiceover. Um, the video itself doesn't have any audio, um, but uh, this is uh, some drone footage that was taken within the past couple of years. And this is the uh, clam midden uh, located off of Great Bay Boulevard. Um, you can see the concentration of cedar trees over here. It looks like this was taken more in the winter time. You can see it's a little bit uh, 
frosty out. Um, but we'll watch the first couple of uh, minutes of this um, just to give you more of an idea of what we're talking about if you haven't gotten a chance to um, see it for yourself. And so here's Seven Bridges Road. Um, it'll pan around the uh, entire landscape and then it'll um, head back towards the midden. And here it's painting back towards the midden. Um, it'll get a little bit closer. And then once it gets to about the four minute mark, um, we'll pause and we'll turn it back to the presentation itself. Here you can see it's getting a little closer. Um, you can get a better idea of visually of what the midden looks like. Um, and so you can see uh, it's about 80 feet long, like I said before, and about nine feet high. It's a little bit tricky to notice um, at first. And keep in mind that this is what the uh, midden looks like nowadays, um, because once uh, we go back to the presentation, I'll show some photographs of what it looked like about 100 years ago. Okay, and that's good, thank you. All right, I'm gonna switch back to my screen. And so, let's see. One moment. Okay, I'm sharing my screen and now I'm gonna go back into presentation mode. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip through the first couple of slides again. Okay, almost there. And so after this, one more, and then we'll be back to where we left off. Okay, so um, here's a photo that was taken from Francis Jordan's uh, Aboriginal fishing stations on the coast of the Middle Atlantic States. Um, so this was um, a book that was published around 1901. Um, I couldn't find the copy itself online, although there are some, um, reproductions of it that are selling um, on Amazon, like reprints. Um, but uh, the caption for the photograph from the book itself says, remains of Pile Dwelling Village in Marsh near Tuckerton, New Jersey, uh, center of the shell mound on the east side. And so 
Um, obviously, the clarity is a little bit different considering it was 1901, but it shows how some of the trees um, are different. Um, some of them might even be the same trees that were there then, um, but it just gives you an idea of what the midden looked like about 100 years ago, actually about 120 years ago. And so on the next slide, here's another photograph of the same midden. Uh, and this is from The Lure of Long Beach by George Somerville. Uh, this was published in 1914, and it was published by the Long Beach Trade. And so um, you can sort of see, um, again, a little blurry, um, but uh, the marsh itself never really changes much. Um, but the minute itself has definitely decreased in size over the years. And so, um, Here's a little bit about uh, legends and lore near the midden. Um, I guess inspired by the legends and lore phrase uh, that the seaport's uh, utilizing for their um, tours that are coming soon. But um, there's been um, some sort of uh, historical, I guess, interest in the midden, of course. Um, but um, there's a lot of legends a lot of uh, misconceptions and a lot of inaccuracies that sort of surround the area. Um, there was an article um, that was written by a Tuckerton and resident, uh, Steve Dodson, in about the late 70s. Um, and he titled it Tuckerton's Race of Giant Men and Historical Mystery. And that can be found on the Tuckerton Historical Society's website. Uh, it's short, maybe about 10 pages or less. And it details Dodson's experiences um, when he read this 1940 um, book. Um, the title is Tides of Time. Uh, the book itself um, talks about these two twin brothers, uh, Art and Alf Gilson, and how they found uh, human remains that um, they said were over seven feet tall on their farm site in Tuckerton. Um, uh, Dodson writes that today this would be considered the harbor town development uh, in Mystic Island. Uh, just to give you a more modern idea of where that might be. Um, so this is in the late 19th century that the uh, Gilson brothers are existing. Um, and Dodson uh, then becomes really interested in this tale, you know, is there truth to it? Um, and so he ends up working with um, descendants of the Gilson brothers at an acne, he says. Um, and he then starts to write this series of letters between himself and uh, all sorts of museum and archaeological professionals uh, throughout the you know, New Jersey area, the New York metropolitan area, and into Philly. And um, he's trying to see, uh, first off, if anybody has any information about this, um, he writes to people at records as well. Um, and then also to see if there, besides any records, um, it's just if there's any validity to um, this tale. Um, the story itself has largely been disproven. Um, how a lot of it, um, when you think about the time, the, the mid to late 1800s, uh, the Gilson brothers themselves were um, what they kind of called amateur uh, archeologists um, in terms of like the, the historical and the social context. Um, there's a lot of interest uh, with um, Darwinism and a lot of rhetoric that's uh, going around that is, is later proven to be um, very like, um, you know, shocking and something that would just would be like ridiculous by today's standards. Um, but at the time, uh, people were very interested in this idea of um, studying, you know, sociology and all of these forms of ideas. And so um, they are more likely to believe things. So that's this time, um, armchair ethnography also becomes popular. Uh, and what that means is that uh, it, it tends to be uh, amateur people who are interested in history and telling um, and sharing other people's stories, um, but uh, their best practices for the, the late 1800s um, certainly are not up to today's standards um, in terms of letting people tell their own stories um, and making sure that we're authentic to um, people themselves, you know, and their own stories that they're, they're willing to share with others. And so um, back to the Jolson brothers, um, their stories largely prove false. Um, the, the tale that they um, kind of spin, whether they believe it, um, whether the, the evidence um, that they found is, is fabricated, 
or whether they, they truly believe um, that these are um, human remains. Um, they say that these giant skeletons had belonged to indigenous people who uh, predated the Lenni Lenape. Uh, later then uh, the story shifts and it says that these people uh, coexisted with the Lenni Lenape um, and it, it's sort of rooted in a lot of um, harsh misbeliefs at the time. They, um, it's very sensationalized, very glorified, over glorified. And they uh, mentioned that they think that the people um, who, who the skeletons belong to uh, were murdered by the Lana Lenape. Um, and they talk about these um, injuries inflicted on the skeletons that were um, testament to a massacre. Of course, this, you know, connects to like this long uh, history um, of colonialism with um, particularly like. Um, these immigrants, particularly white immigrants, believing these outlandish things about the people who were here first. Um, so a lot of that's been disproven. Um, but on the photo on the right, uh, there's Alf and Art Jilson themselves. Um, and so Dodson is one of these people in the 70s that is starting to, you know, kind of really delve into this local history. As a Tuckerman resident, he's very much interested in you know, whether this is true, because at the time there's excavation sites going on uh, in the area, which again, I'll talk about uh, in the next section. Um, but before I get to the Panilla site, um, if anybody has any questions or anything, um, I'm happy to answer them to talking about the middens or talking about um, some of the legends of the area that I kind of delved into. Um, if not, um, I'll pause, I'll give a minute or so, and then I'll jump to the next part. Okay, so if you have a question for Taylor so far, um, you can put it in the chat or take yourself off mute if you'd like to. We'll um, give, a, give a few seconds um, if you're typing. All right, I don't see anything coming through, Taylor. So I think it's safe to uh, have you keep going. All right, so I'll go share screen again. Okay, and now I'll talk a little bit about the Pinellas site um, the, at the Atlantis Golf Course. Um, over here, um, this is an image uh, that's at the Tucker and Seaport. Um, that is a photograph of the Pinella site. Um, and there's some students, um, and it's a collaborative effort led by uh, professors, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, conducting their excavation. And so once the next slide loads, let's see. Seems like it's taking a minute to load. Um, so let me see if I stop share and I go back into it. That might be. Thing. Okay. I'm gonna go back into it now. Let's see if this time. Can everybody see it? I'm gonna, I'm sharing it uh, this time through the web page of my uh, PowerPoint. Um, apologize that that's a little distracting. It seems like it's working a little bit better though. Um, so a little bit of background on the Pinilla site. It was excavated from about 1973 to 1975. And it was later revisited in 2001 over at Tuckerton. Um, they, people say Tuckerton, Little Lake Harbor, sort of where the, the lines blur between the municipalities. Um, but it's over off of Great Bay Boulevard. Um, and the site itself was excavated uh, in partnership between the then Richard Stockton State College, um, today known as Stockton University, uh, and the Archaeology Society of New Jersey. 
And so the Tucker and Seaport Museum's collection contains photographs of the dig and uh, information shared by a local resident, uh, Mr. Carl Bopp. Um, and the archives note that over 105 foot squares were excavated at the Pinellas site. And at located areas used as storage pits, uh, refuse pits, and indications of homes. Um, the site's considered a base camp to the nearby Shell Mound, and it's tied to indigenous groups that uh, predate the Lanai Lenape in this area. And so on to the next slide. Um, here you can see that there's some figures uh, from uh, an article called Collections, Mortality and Immortality, a case study of aging museum collections through faunal analysis from the Pinellas site in Ocean County, New Jersey. Um, this was published about six years ago in the Journal of Mid Middle Atlantic Archaeology, um, written by Devin Lee Ward and Gregory Dennis, Le Le Dennis Letazani, I'm sorry. And so you can see there's a couple of figures. Um, the one on the left, the first one, uh, in depicts a couple of maps showing the location of the Pinellas site, uh, kind of in relation to the rest of Tuckerton. Um, then the second figure shows these maps um, with the 73, 74 uh, excavation sites at Pinella. And so um, they're all plotted along there. Um, and then the third figure talks about um, some of the work uh, in 1975 with this site. And so, uh, the next slide um, shows another picture from the Tucker and Seaport. Um, this one taken from the big site. Um, you can see it's from uh, about 1975. And um, it's kind of showing more about what they were finding there. And so next, um, a little bit from Stockton University Special Collections. Um, that's their archives. And so... Uh, these are all from the same newspaper, um, but I just cropped out certain portions that they were a little bit more easy to view. Um, but uh, this was the Stockton Chronicle, uh, a student publication uh, from the time. Um, this edition is from May of 1975, and it talks about the Pinellas site. Uh, and the Pinellas site itself is named after um, the people at the time who owned that site. Um, they were the Pinella family. That's where that name comes from, pre the Atlantis Golf Course. And so uh, the article itself says, students dig a glimpse into the short past. And so it explains how this was an effort um, by an archaeology field methods um, group of students, about 28 or so, um, led by an adjunct professor at Stockton. Um, and um, supposedly, um, they ended up finding over 70 different features, including, um, like I said before, these refuse pits, um, lots and lots of hearths. And so what I um, really thought was um, very interesting about this article is when uh, the professor um, notes that the site is important because of its excellent preservation. Uh, because the oysters and clamshells neutralize the soil, the foodstuffs such as deer, bird, and turtle um, are well-preserved. And this enables us to establish the diets of these prehistoric inhabitants. And so um, that's what's really interesting about middens is that um, you can learn a lot more about people who lived here. You can learn more about their daily um, existence. And so this is what people are now finding through these um, excavation sites. And so, um, moving on from that, I'll talk a little bit about the Nanticoke Lenape and Lenape tribal nation um, itself. And it may seem, I'm a bit of a misnomer for this presentation um, because it focuses on the Lenape and Lenape um, tribal nation. But um, for the most part, this midden, these archaeological sites are delving into indigenous groups um, who predate the Lenape and Lenape. Um, however, um, this is both their land and so it's very relevant when uh, discussing the area to talk about um, the Lenape and Lenape and um, older groups as well. Um, so the Nanticoke Lenape and Lenape tribal nation, uh, a lot of people um, sometimes have misconceptions on how it's pronounced, um, but it's Lenai with a long I and then Lenape. Um, people sometimes try to uh, suggest a, a Lake Lenape, um, but that's uh, again, a different pronunciation. That's not the correct one. 
uh, from the tribal website. And so the tribal headquarters is in Bridgeton, New Jersey, over in Cumberland County in the uh, western half of the state. Um, they are a constitutional government, um, so they have their own rules and whatnot. And they um, have these community services um, that are administered through uh, tribally controlled 501c3, um, so a nonprofit, it's got social services, community development, and the organization itself is known as the Nantico Kalana Lenape Indians of New Jersey. And so, um, moving on to a little bit of the constitutional government, um, this is taken directly from the Nantico Kalana Lenape Tribal Nation website. Um, and so it states that the Nantico Kalana Lenape Tribal Nation is constitutionally organized, self governing, inherently sovereign American Indian nation. Uh, and so that's important to recognize is that they have um, uh, members that are enrolled in this tribal nation have dual citizenship. Um, and so they're a member nation of the Confederation of Sovereign Nantico Bay Tribes. Uh, it's an intertribal union and a few other uh, tribes in the area, um, mostly located in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, um, and that region. And so they're all historically and genealogically interrelated. It's recognized by the state of New Jersey. Um, and it talks about how uh, they're a voting member nation of the National Congress of American Indians, which is the our oldest and largest organization of American Indian tribes. Um, so it's really important uh, when we're looking into the past that we don't get caught up in the past, um, which sounds kind of confusing, uh, but essentially, um, when we're learning about the past, we're learning about people, we're learning about um, people's families. And so it's important to recognize that history is continuous, that um, you can't look at the past without considering the present and also considering the future. Um, what are the ramifications of you know, this research that you bring to light? Or what's the impact that um, sharing this information has um, on local communities beyond that? And more importantly, how can you conduct research and how can you learn things and go about that in a respectful manner? And so um, uh, with anything related to um, indigenous peoples, it's always best to um, not seek out presenters, you know, I'm, I'm only one presenter, but to, more importantly, first and foremost, um, go to the, the tribal nations uh, website themselves. Um, these, um, are the people who this is their history, this is their you know ancestry, and so they're still active today. Um, they're active participants in the community. Um, they host um, both open and closed practice gatherings. Um, of course, with COVID, that's um, shifted in the past year or two. Um, but their website is the NLLtribe.com, uh, and this banner is taken from the website, and it says we are still here, and I think that's important uh, to consider. Um, that this group is still here. Um, we talk about them. We don't talk about them in the past tense. Um, that we, you know, remember that as we go forward. Uh, kind of going hand in hand with that land acknowledgement statement with being mindful of, you know, where we tread when we engage with history and engage with others' communities. And so, um, in terms of other recommended works, um, of course, there's all sorts of works throughout the presentation. Um, but something that popped up a lot uh, was Looking to Meet the Service, The Story of Archaeology in New Jersey by R. Allen uh, Munier, published in 2003. Um, uh, I personally have not read the whole thing, so I, I can't give my 100% take on it. But um, that's something considered if you're interested um, in archaeology in New Jersey. Um, and so I want to say thank you. Um, my email's there, um, but I'm gonna stop sharing now um, and talk a little bit more and then we'll kind of enter the Q&A period if anyone has any questions. Okay, and so I know I'll give everybody a couple of minutes to type or formulate their thoughts. Um, I never wanna rush anybody into um, doing so. All right, looks like uh, first and foremost, uh, Taylor, that was awesome. Um, a lot of really interesting uh, information about the local tribes here and um, uh, 
a lot of great photos. That video of the shell mound or the midden was really, really cool too. Did you do that drone footage? No, I am nowhere. Okay. Uh, skilled to do that um but I, I happen to found it and um, I have the YouTube link in the, the presentation if anybody okay. wants a copy of that perfect yeah um that'd be great because it is a longer video so if you want to check that out a little bit more you can um there is a question in the chat um does your work assist or support current Lenai Lenape as they are still an active indigenous group in New Jersey that's a good question yeah so that's a great question um a lot of this um, research was based on some work that, that Paul talked about a little bit um, that I did in undergrad. Um, I just recently graduated my bachelor's uh, in spring of 2021. Um, so I was doing that through Stockton University um, under a, a foundation um, type of grant. And so um, while I was doing that work, at the end, I hosted a dialogue and reflection session uh, is what we call them at Stockton. And so there, um, First and foremost, we had a representative from the Nantucook Lana Lenape Tribal Nation. Um, she was gracious enough to attend and explain to it. We wanted to make sure that um, like any type of research that we were conducting at the university was like, um, you know, it was definitely um, informed by the tribal nation themselves. Um, and so that's sort of assisting and supporting um, and giving a bit of a, a platform through the university um, to a lot of students um that honestly are not informed about like local history or if they're not from you know the south jersey area and they're coming to the university okay great uh next question uh are there lene lenape in other states besides the east coast well that's a good one um so um a lot of my um very rudimentary knowledge is um, focused uh, in this area, uh, Southern Richard County, Atlanta County, South Jersey. Um, but um, from what I've gathered, um, there is um, a population of Lani Lenape over in Oklahoma. And so uh, that, uh, of course, was um, from a lot of um, indigenous people being forcibly displaced um, throughout uh, colonization efforts. And so um, today, there is a decent population over in Oklahoma. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Okay. Um, I'll give anyone a chance to either come off mute or add another question in the chat. I actually um, have one for you too, Taylor. Um, so at the Jacques Cousteau Reserve, you know, we're always, um, one of the things that we're always looking into and keeping an eye on um, are flooding and rising seas um, in and around uh, New Jersey coastal towns, um, uh, the bay right here. So uh, have you, do you know if flooding um, is impacting the midden? And if so, how? Um, is that one of the reasons why it's uh, sort of getting smaller or um, so do you know if, if there are any flooding impacts is, is, is impacting that mound in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as far as I'm aware, I've seen it referenced in certain papers, um, but more um, so about like the sea level. Um, a lot of like scholars um, were arguing over what the exact heights were at certain times throughout the centuries that this midden's been existing. Um, and so that of course would play a role in, you know, how does it, you know, stay throughout the years? Um, what shifts about it? Um, as far as I've read, it's, it's declined in size um, pretty considerably, but it's still considered like the largest, if not, um, they, they say it's the largest in the New Jersey area, um, but people sometimes try to say that it's one of the largest in the East Coast. Um, so, I'm not quite sure how flooding may play a role in it in the future, especially with things like global warming. Um, so I would think so. Um, I think it's definitely something to consider. Uh, how do we protect these? Because I know this that whole area is protected and it's prohibited from walking. Like you can't just visit the midden besides it being dangerous to walk on the marsh, of course. Okay, yeah, that's definitely a good point to to make a, you can see it from the road, right? But you can't. Yes, get my there. photos from the road, you can yeah. use perfectly fine. Please don't wander <laughs> into the marsh. I, I could only imagine, oh God. 
Oh, the uh, comment about Life on the Edge drones takes beautiful footage of JC Nair and Tucker and agreed the beautiful, beautiful scenery that might have um, uh, reminded me of Life on the Edge drones or might have been, you know, who filmed that? I'm not really sure. I didn't look at the YouTube link carefully, but um, okay. Any other comments, questions for Taylor today? Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for. Um coming out today and zooming with us um well, i know much a bit about my ooh. oh okay oh, no, i was just going to say thank you taylor for presenting today um we have a lot of other good uh thank yous and comments in the chat um as we sign off so mm -hmm. thank you again for um doing this presentation for us um and uh did you want to share your any other emails or links in the chat before you go Sure, I'll type my uh, email in the chat. It's uh, my last name, Ketchum, K-E-T-C-H-A-M-T -E at uh, go.stockton.edu. And so if anyone's interested in anything like that, um, I know Paul mentioned a little bit about the uh, digital exhibit that I was working on as a uh, result of this research. Um, like any digital exhibit, um, it's current, it's constantly, it's growing and, and changing and evolving. And so the link right now on the Stockton University like archive website um, is down, um, but um, eventually it'll be up there if you take a look in a couple of weeks. Right now they're in the middle cool. of the 50th anniversary, uh, 50th anniversary celebrations for the institution. So. Oh, excellent. Yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on that. So great. Um, well, thanks again. Um, and uh, that's it for our Lunch and Learn for today. Thank you again, Taylor. Uh, and thanks everybody for tuning in today. I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.